What is mastering and why it is so important? What's the difference between mixing and mastering? And what are the differences between mastering on analog gear and with plugins? If you find these questions interesting, then this episode is just for you. My name is Amit Weiner and I'm a composer for film and TV and I'm on a mission to help you grow your music career. This podcast is aimed at musicians that want to grow their music career. Let's hear it directly from mastering engineer from LA, Maor Applebaum himself. Mastering is art of presentation. It's, and, and there's a lot of compromise in presentation. Uh, and sometimes you degrade the product in a positive way. And part of enhancing is, in, in a way, degrading the original because you're changing it, but you might change it in a good way. So I look at mastering in that way, and I like to make sure that when I do something, it feels like it's coming into you. It's, and it doesn't matter if it's hi-fi, lo-fi, bright, warm, dark, uh, sparkling or or undefined if it carries the message and presents it right and when I say right there's no right or wrong but present it right means that it makes you feel it then it worked welcome to rewind an optimistic podcast that'll help you in your successful career in music Amit Weiner hosts musicians, composers, professors, and sound wizards as they share their life stories and career decisions. Stay tuned, it's gonna be epic. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Rewind, the Musicians Podcast the podcast that will help you build and elevate your career in music. I'm Amit Weiner, your host. I'm a composer for film and TV, and I'm on a mission to help musicians find career opportunities and help musicians find their way in the huge world of the music industry. In this episode, our guest is a very, very special guest, mastering engineer from LA, Maor Applebaum. Maor, thank you so much for being here tonight or this morning it's tonight soon morning <laughs> no just joking thank you very much for having me on your show on the podcast uh it's a pleasure for me and uh i'll be happy to to give you some insights from you know what what i what i do Thank you so much. It's a huge honor. Maor Applebaum, I'll introduce you to the listeners. Maor Applebaum is a mastering engineer and musician. After working as staff engineer, mixing, recording, and mastering for famed record producer Sylvia Massey Shivi at Radio Star Studios in Weed, California, Maor moved to Los Angeles, where he opened his private mastering suite. Maor's credit list runs from Faith No More, Limp Biscuit, and Sepultura to Eric Gales. And yes, wow, Maor, we have a lot to discuss. Let's start. Maybe you can share your career journey and how you've got to where you are today. I guess I started like a lot of people as musicians that uh, wanted to um, experience the recording and production. And... Uh, I went and studied sound engineering and I interned and assisted, you know, did some of that stuff. Um, and then, uh, then I did some broadcasting and I did some work in live shows. You know, I, I did a bunch of a bunch, uh, can't say everything was great, <laughs> but, um, I knew audio is something I want to do. And, it wasn't the money factor um, to draw me to it because I knew it's it's more of the interest. So I worked, you know, in a studio, and I lived in the studio, and like you know, it, it was kind of a living on the sofa in a way. Of course, you develop, and then then I moved into broadcasting because that studio changed owners and basically it was hard to 
restart. So I, I found a job as a broadcasting engineer and that paid me well. Um, and it helped me also um, make enough money to make a living, but also to um, support my hobby as a musician. And that way I had money to um, invest in instruments and record stuff. And so that's kind of the beginning, you know, it's, it's, it's basically, it's a long story. I had different bands. I did shows with the bands and recordings and just like a lot of people do. Um, and then when I was 32, I wanted to change my career because prior to 32, I was already doing mastering, but it was more niche stuff, and 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 I really wanted to to learn, and I, and I couldn't find mentors in the field of mastering. So I figured, well, if I can't find mentors in the field of mastering, at least at least I'll I'll learn other stuff from people who are not doing mastering. So I um I, I got in touch with Sylvia Massey. Back then, I worked with a band that she worked with. So it was a small band that she worked with and I worked with as well. So then there was a connection in a way. She offered me to come and be there, work for free. That means, you know, and uh, and I said, yeah, fine. That's fine with me. And um, I organized everything and uh, I took a plane and I flew, worked for her in a studio called Radio Star Studios in Weed, California. And it was a very unique studio complex in an old theater. And there were different consoles there in different rooms. And it's a hall. It's a, it's like a theater, so it's a big hall. And there I basically worked with bands as a, as one of the staff, you know, the engineers there. Sometimes I assisted, sometimes I did some you know, maintenance work. Sometimes I did uh, assistant to mixing. Sometimes I mixed. Sometimes I mess. It's like I did kind of all around stuff, but it gave me experience in listening to the music, listening to the process, seeing what's happening, understanding the the, the workflow. And uh, I did that for quite a long time during that year which means I, I was every day in the studio from morning to night. It, it basically, you can call it an internship because I didn't get paid, but I was doing work as like a staff guy there. Um, and uh, it was fun. It was challenging. It was interesting. It was uh, a lot of learning. And um, I don't regret it for a minute. It's 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 very important. And I think... That helped me learn so much. And then uh, after uh, about eight months, I moved to LA. I started doing my own thing by uh, getting, you know, mastering clients because I wanted to focus on mastering. But because I just got here during the day, you know, I had to get another job just so I can pay the bills, uh, the rent, the car, all that stuff. So I got a job selling pro audio gear at Sam Ash. And I did that for about four months. So during most of the day, I would work at the shop selling pro audio gear. And then in the night, I would master. And then some days I had a different shift. So I could work maybe in the morning. It was dependent on the shift. But most of the time, it was working during the day there till evening. And then I would late evening maybe. And then I would work in the night doing mastering. And then the days that I wouldn't work there at Sam Ash, I would work as well. And basically I did that for four months until I couldn't do both of them because uh, the time scheduling became tough. And uh, and then I just did mastering. And you would you recommend young uh, mixing engineers or mastering engineers to do such um, to work in such a job like uh, selling audio equipment? Do you think it uh, benefits your career? I, I definitely think it's very. Again, this is my opinion, but I definitely think it was very important to my career growth because when you work in that business uh, of of selling gear, 
the first thing is you get exposed to gear. So you see what's new and you know what to look for because you're the one selling it. So you know that information and you learn as you go because you meet the representative of the companies, of the distributions, in the shop. They teach you what's new. So you learn from that. Second thing is um, you can get discounts on gear too. That's quite good when, you know, when you work there and you can save some money that way, right? And buy the gear that you want. Third thing is that you meet people, um, you meet reps from companies, you meet clients that come into the shop and they can become your clients too. You basically learn how to present yourself and present the stuff that uh, you're selling and you're finding solutions to people who need stuff and you can recommend things and in time, some of those people become your friends too. So I met a lot of people during that time. And those four months were very important for me as well, because uh, it introduced me to different people that I'm still in touch with them. We're talking about like 15 years ago. So, And I met some really cool people who were clients there, who till today are friends. So I do recommend, but not everybody wants to do that. You know, it's... It's not an it's not a high paying job un, unless you sell a lot and still it requires a lot of work. It's kind of a career, you know. You, when you go to retail, you need you really need to put yourself into it in order to get results. But um, but it's usually good for musicians because they they know that sometimes musicians have to go on tour and maybe they can find a uh, substitute there or whatever. But not in every place, but. It's very normal that musicians will go and work there. So if you're there, you're going to meet some musicians anyway. It's a good networking tool too. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about your uh, clients. So how was it to work with Fate No More, Limp Biscuit, and Yes? How was the feeling? What did you expect to find when you worked with them? And how was it for you? With Limp Biscuit, I didn't have any connection to the band. Uh, it was two singles that were done um, at a certain period of time in their uh, career. And they just got to me from the person who sent it to me. And that they don't, there was no connection between me and the band. They just, you know, the master went to them and went out. But I don't think people even know I've done those uh, singles. One is End of Slaughter. Um, End of Slaughter, I think it was called. And then the other one was a cover of Ministry's song, Thieves. Um, so that's with Limp Bizkit. And this is a long time ago. And then with Faith No More, I did um, two albums with them. One was the comeback album in 2015, I think, and then which is called Soul Invictus. And then that album included three singles that two of them have done before the album. And they included remixes, and they were different types of mixes of those two songs and B sides of them of remixes. And then there was another single after the record came out with a B side as a remix. And then a year after, I remastered the first album, We Care a Lot, which came out, I think, in 85. Um, and that included bonus tracks. So it was the album and bonus tracks and remixes and live uh, recordings. And with Faith No More, it was a pleasure to work. Uh, those were two eras. One era, which was the later era, which was the comeback album that I did. That was the last lineup that was, you know, the last current, if you want to call it, whatever lineup it was. And then the remaster of the first album was the first line. So two different lineups, two different singers, two different guitar players. The only people that were the same were the drummer, the bass player, and the keyboard player. Uh, working with Faith No More was beyond amazing. Um, communication was great. Um, the band actually uh, hired me. And it, it was just like a dream come true. You work with a, an iconic band that you know their songs and 
and um, you really get energized when you do it, and it's exciting, and it's a band that a lot of people like and respect, and it was just, um, you would never think that you would do it, and boom, it lands on you. It's like, you know, it, it's definitely a huge landmark in my career. You know, it's probably, I don't know, probably the biggest turning point for me. And um, it, it, till today, it's one of those records and bands that people will, will talk to me about. And I would always tell them, like, my, my face starts to shine when I talk about it. Wow. Um, so it, it was really a pleasure. And I met the band later after we finished the album they toured it the album was not out yet but they started touring it and it was out i think two months after or something i, I don't remember but i met the band and everybody was so cool with me and they were appreciative and they thanked me and, and, and they, they were so cool I, it was amazing people it was such a such an experience yes was also an amazing experience because I grew up listening to Yes, 90125, you know, and and I knew some of the other songs too. My brother was is a big fan too. And um, I did six records, six albums with Yes, one studio album and five live albums. And again, it was a pleasure working with it, with, with them. Um, I actually saw those shows. So um, some of them were shows that I saw and I got to work on them as well. So that was another, play, you know, great pleasure. Also working with Meatloaf and, and Eric Gales and Sepultura and and Sabaton and Armored Saint, Starset, all these bands, they're great bands. It was a pleasure working with them all, really. And I have a specific question. When you work with such high-profile clients, so what are the feedbacks usually that you get? Is it like, can you turn the EQ a little bit up, up in a 2K or is it more a general feeling comments that you have? Uh, can you make it a little bit more bright or a little bit more sad? What are the feedbacks that you get and how do you deal with them? Every record has its own sound and it has its own volume in terms of in, you know the impact the volume the tone and also the communication some bands communicate by feeling they'll say oh i need it more exciting or i need it more you know energetic or and you have to decipher what that means you know it's like it's like a it's a guessing game they say something you got to guess okay was is warm mean this or warm mean that is exciting mean this or that a lot of times you got to figure that out and some bands they actually can say, oh, uh, can you lower down this amount of that or you can you add boost this frequency? So it's real dependent. And sometimes they combine it. They'll say, you know, I need more excitement. Can you add this? Or I need it a bit brighter. Can you add more 10K? You know, so they'll combine. So it's not just one way of communicating. And, and it doesn't matter if you're an independent band or major band you know, or legacy band. Legacy band can be independent or major. They're just, legacy means, you know, they've built their um, fan base throughout the years and they became iconic. And, um, you know, I, I have a, a share of independent clients and legacy clients and um, anything from guitar-oriented records like Eric Gales or Ingve Malmsteen or Walter Trout, um, Andy Wood, Joe Stump, to to hip hop records, to metal records, to pop records, to singer songwriter, to progressive rock, to singles, to you know, I've done stuff for Dream Theater, for Mike Mangini, who was in Dream Theater, for Mr. Bungle, for Sons of Apollo, for it just there's a bunch of stuff, and each one is totally different. A lot of times you actually work with the mixing engineer or the producer, so you're not always in touch with the band. Sometimes you're in touch with the management or record label. So everybody can give you feedback based on what they uh, 
they uh, communicate with. Yeah, you know, that's very interesting because it actually resembles the way that I'm working as a composer with directors or producers because music is uh, something that is very difficult to describe in words, right? As you said, if somebody wants your music to be more exciting and that is a comment that I received all the time from directors, let's, could you do it more uplifting or more exciting? So what do you do? Do you add a violin or do you just turn the volume up a little bit? I mean, that's for you to decide how to interpret those requests, right? Yeah. And sometimes what you do is you say, hey, here's two versions, you know, is this what you meant or that? Sometimes you, uh, you got to go extreme a bit. It's like, no, 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 that's too much. Go down or or the opposite. Yeah, you never know. You, you, you really have to gauge it. Um, I like to use the phone a lot because that helps me understand more what the person wants. I think that emails and texts are harder to understand because in a phone, if someone says something, you can immediately react and say, you mean like this? Or in text, you can respond, but you don't know if he's at that moment responding. So you have to wait for his respond. Now you're waiting. You know, it's like, so a lot of times, if you really want to get the job done, I find that phone or Zoom or, you know, a, a, a chat, but vo- vo- voice chat, you know, voice like like an actual thing, you know, even recorded messages sometimes. The problem with messages is you don't know when they listen and when they reply. So it's good to have it on the same timeline. Um, but Today we live in a world where a lot of people uh, prefer emails and text and th- that can slow down the process a lot. Interesting. These are great tips, I think, for making the communication uh, better while talking on the phone or on Zoom. So, Maor, could we uh, talk about the, the art of mastering itself? What is your vision of a good mastered song or a good mastered song? Uh, track that you've made what is a good mastering for you like asking you what's a good composition there's no good or bad there's just what fits you know it's like i mean someone can do a horrible job and everybody would love it and then how can you argue with that you could say oh well they didn't hear a better job and sometimes they'll hear a better job and say no i actually prefer the one that's horrible <laughs> you know but but that's the thing it's like It's a taste thing, okay? You might like, you might not. And and it's a fitting thing. If it fits and it doesn't sound great, it fits. <laughs> if it fits, it sounds great. It fits. I think what makes good mastering is if you find a good presentation of what the song is, if you can find a way to make that translation from what you got to make it translate better, even if it's 5%. Five percent is a hundred percent because that five percent at the end of the day is being played. So if you added five percent to the equation, still a hundred percent of the song is out there, and that's what people listen to and and so um it's really about what you feel, you know, if you give a song to ten different mastering engineers, you're gonna get ten different results. Some of them might be amazing, and you might like them. Some of them might be amazing and you won't. They can all be amazing and you'll prefer a certain one and they can be maybe not good or it's a combination one of them you'll connect to sometimes you'll connect to the volume sometimes you'll connect to the distortion because sometimes if it's fuzzy it excites sometimes you'll connect to the dynamics sometimes you'll connect to how like open it is or how warm it is closed and You know, mastering is very visual because if you take a painting and you put it in front of, uh, uh, you know, in front of you on a wall, if the wall is white and there's no frame, it makes you look at the painting differently than if you add a frame, which will create kind of a, a shadow in a way, or it will magnify certain things or the positioning of the light. If it's above in the center or below to the side, they will all, all affect how the colors will look. And... It's, the picture is the picture you can like it or not but the way the light 
and the framing and the wall behind it is presented to it will give you a different feel or perspective of how the picture is, even though it's the same picture. That's a wonderful metaphor. Mastering is art of presentation. It's, and, and there's a lot of compromise in presentation. Uh, and sometimes you degrade the product in a positive way. And part of enhancing is, in, in a way, degrading the original because you're changing it, but you might change it in a good way. So I look at mastering in that way, and I like to make sure that when I do something, it feels like it's coming into you. It's, and it doesn't matter if it's hi-fi, lo-fi, bright, warm, dark, uh, uh, sparkling or, or undefined if it carries the message and presents it right and when I say right there's no right or wrong but present it right means that it makes you feel it then it worked and let's talk a little bit about gear because this is something that people are always interested in and I know you have your own Maor Applebaum hardware and plugins, which uh, we will discuss also because that's very interesting. And actually, this podcast has the Maor Applebaum oven on the stereo output to a little bit enhance the vocals. So this is a wonderful plugin to use, the oven. I'm using it a lot. Uh, but before that, what is the difference for you between working with analog gear versus working in the box with digital plugins? So I like to call it hardware and software, okay? Because analog and digital, digital can be hardware too. So I think both of them are great tools. Nowadays, plugins sound amazing. And they've just, that throughout the years, they're just being better and better and better and really, really good. But plugins are not the same as hardware, even if they're emulated very well. There's differences for both sides. For example, analog hardware, hardware needs to be part of an ecosystem, like a clocking, like conversion, cabling, power, all that stuff is part of what it is, where plugins don't have any of that besides they have the host or the operating system. Of course, clocking will affect them too, but in general, um, when you're using hardware, you're using the actual hardware, analog or digital, and then the clocking, the electricity, the cabling, the interfacing, the host, the EW, of course, OS, all that. But in plug-in world, you're, lim you're limited to a smaller section of that. And some cases, plugins will work better for you because then you don't have the conversion, you don't have other stuff involved. But there's a lot of things that in analog, the plugins don't have yet. I'm saying yet because they're improving all the time. And even if an emulation is about 50%, that's still enough to make it sound good. That being said, it's not equal. It's not the same. And it's a lot of time program dependent. So, for example, it might sound similar on one instrument or vocals, but on a mix, it might not or a drum bus or a you know, guitar bus. So analog still has something very unique to it. I personally love working with hardware and I have a lot of hardware. I have a lot of custom gear. Uh, probably the most famous one is the oven. Then I have the stove, I have the grill, I have the cooker. Then I have another thing called the workshop and the torch and the bench. Then I have other units that were uh, custom modified for me, which they were originally a, a different unit made by the company. And then they tweaked it for me, with me, like suggestions that I wanted and they tweaked for me. So I got a lot of gear that was modified for me. So my setup is a combination between custom built and designed gear with me. So I'm part of that, which a lot of the gear is, most of the gear is that way too now. Uh, and then a combination of modified gear, which means it's gear that was customly modified for me. And then I have also high-end top-tier gear that's not modified, but standard. 
um, or I have early versions of it. So maybe they changed it later on and I have an early version or the opposite. Uh, and I also have some rarity gear, which has been discontinued for many years. Um, so I do have a lot of that and I swim in it, <laughs> uh, as they say. Um, and, and in terms of plugins, so most of my work is done out of the box on hardware. And then some of the stuff I add plugins later on. So we'll call it hybrid. And then very, very small amount of work would be done in the box. Um, it's very rare that I do in the box. So really the highest percentage is either out of the box or out of the box plus plugins on certain stuff, which is the hybrid. And the least amount would be just plugin work. I got a ton of plugins because I write a lot of presets for different companies. And I also do some testing and stuff like that for some of the companies. So I have a lot of them, but it doesn't mean I use them as much. Um, I mostly do the presets for a lot of them, but uh, it's good to have the arsenal of them because they can come in handy once in a while. Uh, but there's so many of them. So, I haven't heard all of them, <laughs> only the ones that I've done presets for and a few that I played with. So some I know. Uh, but I do recommend to people who are thinking of hardware or plug-in world, I suggest testing and seeing because sometimes you'll be surprised and it sounds really good and it's worth the investment because you want to enjoy what you're doing. And even though it costs money, at the end of the day, you're using it. So you're paying it off in time. Some stuff takes a longer time to pay off, but you're using it. So you might as well, you know. Yeah. And let's talk about your own, the, your signature brand, Maor Applebaum, uh, the oven, the stove, the one that you've mentioned. Which kind of gear uh, is available in hardware and what kind is in software? As I mentioned before, I'm using the plugin of the oven, which is great. I'm using it all the time on, in this podcast. And it also has a very unique design and all the knobs have different names than we used to. So could you describe how you made the oven and what makes it so unique, both in design and also with how it sounds? A, a, a nice portion of my gear was developed for me with people, but not all of it is um, for sale. So a lot of it I only have, I only own, but there is a line of products, which we call the oven line, which is a collaboration between Handy Amps and me. Handy Amps has his own products, and then we collaborated on a line together that we're both uh, co-developing and designing and, and tweaking and doing all of that together to make sure we're bringing something very unique to the table that we both like. And it's always tested here as well and and tested in, in my, my, my collaborator's place. And we listen to it, we test, you know, and... And then I go out to different studios and test. So the whole process is, it's a long process of, of developing and testing it and checking it in different places and making sure it's what we want. Um, so they look similar. They're white faceplate with black knobs and they're all under the oven line. We have the oven, which is a tube in solid state. We have the stove, which is a tube in solid state, but they're different tube topologies. Then we have the grill, which is a solid state unit. And then we have the cooker, which is a solid state. And then we have uh, a preamp called the steamer, which is a dual mono uh, preamp and DI. And then we have a channel strip, a mono channel strip called the roaster that has a a solid state pre and it has a tube saturation circuit has an optical compressor 
a three band EQ and a and an air band, and it even has a one watt tube power amplifier that you can connect to a fifty watt speaker, and now you have a guitar amplifier. Um, so all those are in collaboration with Handy Amps, and you can find them online um, very easily. You know, if you type the oven Handy Amps, and then there's a, one of the tabs is the oven line, and it shows all of them. In terms of the plugins, we signed with Brainworks to develop and model the oven plugin, and it's distributed by Plugin Alliance. Um, the plugin is about 50% of the sound of the oven, which is a lot because it's a very, very unique unit and it's not easy to model it. But even getting 50% is a lot and it sounds really good. The hardware you'll feel much more because it's the hardware. But at the same time, there's functions in the plugin that the hardware doesn't have, like the stereo imaging changing in the mono making and the um, mix knob and the headroom knob. And then uh, the calibration originally on the unit is a full scale collab co uh, calibration for left and right to match the left and right or uh, to match incoming levels. But in the plugin, instead of doing that, we put three calibration points so you can actually change the sound of the unit just by the calibration points. Um, so the plugin has things that the hardware doesn't have. And of course, you can put a bunch of the you a bunch of plugins on your session, where in the hardware it's not cheap, it's 6600. You know, it's not so to to pay six thousand six hundred dollars for one, you, you probably you'll have to have a lot in order to put on a session. So <laughs> but um but the plugin sounds really good, and I know it's being used on major motion picture. You know all these films. Um, I've seen screenshots of sessions that had thirty times five point one, which is one hundred and eighty, um, one hundred and eighty ovens in a session, and it's been used on major hits on the radio, and major tv shows composers use it for games for podcasts just like you um uh, uh soundtracks movie soundtracks tv soundtracks game soundtracks uh, advertisements um records albums ep you know you name it on mix bus drums bus guitar bus vocals a lot of Places. And, and we're really happy to see that because it's really unique. And we're going to do probably another plugin or two or maybe more. Right now, we don't know exactly because we're in the process. Some of it I can't talk yet about it. And some of it we're still negotiating and seeing what's happening. But there will be a few more plugins. And in the meantime, I'm working of course with other companies on other developments of of um plugins and expansion packs i did a expansion pack for the stl tone control hub so there's a mastering pack so if you buy or subscribe to a control hub you can get my pack which has 50 profiles or presets whatever you want to call them that have different sounds and then you can alter each one with the controls there. So it's a really cool plugin. Uh, it's the control hub from STL tones and mine is the more Apple bomb mastering expansion pack. So you can just buy the plugin and then you get a free expansion pack. You can choose which one you want or subscribe and get each one. And, um, and then I, I write other presets for other companies and, Currently working on some more ideas. Probably going to have a few more products for twenty for two thousand twenty four and twenty two thousand twenty five, and maybe a few more plugins too.
Super interesting. And let's talk just a little bit about the oven because I think it's interesting marketing wise. So without doing a full tutorial because it's difficult doing it in an audio program, but I'm looking right now at the uh, knobs of the, the oven and they all have very, I would say, weird or unusual names like temp, cook, burners, sizzle and flow. So first of all, could you explain what are these doing and why did you choose those names and was it your own idea to use such um, different names instead of EQ and threshold and ratio and all the regular knobs that we are usually see? Well, our knobs are snobs. So <laughs> um, we don't have actually threshold or ratio. We don't have any compression. There's no compression circuit there. It does maybe compress in a way, but it's not from compression as a compressor. It's just the nature of the circuitry. Um, the idea behind the oven was um, I wanted a tool that you can get things done quick, but good. And it's very hard to get quick and good at the same time. You know, you're going to fight it. You know, it's like, it's like, write a, 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 a very good uh, uh, orchestral composition, but do it in two minutes. You know, it's, a, it's hard. So I thought of a concept that, you know, first of all, if we take the technical side out, it might confuse people in the beginning, which it did to some people, but it might naturally connect to others. And those who got confused, if they'll play with it a bit, they'll they'll learn it. So the temp, cook, all, and all those, they're names of functions that when you work them, you feel what kind of you saw there. Like, like for example, sizzle. When you think of sizzle, you know, like let's say you're heating something on a pan, it goes like... It sizzles. That's the upper portion. So... That's like our air. We call it warm air. And that's our top end that sizzles. And that's what it does when you open it. And the burners, uh, low, mid, and high, they're EQs, but they're EQs that become saturation EQs as you turn the temp on more and more. So the more you turn the temp knob, you know, from when it's zero, it's basically like a very nice sounding EQ that's very pleasing to the ear. It has a really good control. It's very wide band. But once you move that that temp knob, you're basically turning it on and on. You know, you're giving it more and more. That changes the EQ to more saturation, but not aggressive, aggressive saturation, unless you change the... Um, the temp range to high, but still it has a lot of range. So temp gets you that energy, you know, it's like you're heating it up. And then the cook knob, it adds kind of a a bloominess to the sound, it gives it even a, a bit of a 3D feel and like a halo. And uh, you have bake and broil bake. Is very natural to it. Broil is tighter. And then electric and gas is the intensity. Electric is less intense and gas pushes it more. And then uh, flow. Flow, basically, it's how circuit one feeds the circuit two. If you put it at 10, you get the full harmonics and richness. But in some cases, you can clip it or distort it. In that case, you move from 10 to 9, and it cleans it up more because now you get less of that saturation. When you move from 9 to 8, you will lose more volume, and you get, you get less of that saturation. But from 8 and downwards, it's very volume-related, so... Unless you push the unit super hard, when you go down there, you're already lowering down. So that's more if you push the unit to the extreme, and then you can lower down. Um, uh, every switch under the burner 
the type is how the EQ is either frequency, like in the low and the high, or the bell type, which is in the one in the mid, on the mid burn. And then in the sizzle, you have two types of sizzle frequency ranges, and that's what it is. Um, yeah, that's that's basically it on the plugin. Of course, you have the temp range low and high, and that's how much you're introducing the saturation and the energy into the temp. And they're all interactive. So anything you're going to do on the EQ, once you're going to change temp, temp it's going to change the sound. Uh, once you add the cook, you're going to add a different dimension to it. So the thought was just let's make something sounding really good with a huge range of usage from very subtle to very aggressive and in between, just inspirational. You don't have to think technical. You can just think in your mind, I need it warmer, I need it brighter, you know, sizzling. But as a user of the oven myself, I can um, say that it is very inspirational to use and it gives a lot of uh, inspiration and creativity while using it. So, Maor, so far it has been such a wonderful and very interesting episode, and thank you so much for your time so far. And I have just two last questions. You can have three if you want. Okay. <laughs> I'll start with two. One about AI and the other about career tips. So, about AI, everybody is talking. We are recording this episode at the end of 2023. And everybody is talking about AI all year long. And just a week ago... As an example, Output has released what is called Co-Producer, which is a, a tool that can help musicians, composers to write music and compose music. But in all the Facebook groups that I'm in, all the composers are all the time afraid of AI that will replace us composers. So first of all, do you use AI tools yourself? And are you afraid that AI mastering tools will replace mastering engineers in the near future? I personally don't use any AI stuff. And I can also tell you, I don't play with it. When I say I don't play, I mean, I don't even like, I don't like for the fun of it, try these things because every time you do that, you're feeding a machine, you're teaching it. So to me, I stay away from all that because I don't want to feed the machine. I don't want to teach the machine. And if it can replace us, sure, it can replace us. The reason it can replace us is because at the end of the day, it's not about quality. It's about acceptance. So, for example, if if a plugin or if an AI program does something that sounds fine enough, that will work for people. Even if you do something that's of a higher quality and it will touch people's hearts, at the end of the day, the mass majority of people will go with what's given to them. So if a record label decides they don't want anybody writing music and they just hire one guy to operate an AI machine and that's how they're putting the hits out, that's what people are going to listen to. Because that's what's being fed to them. Now, there's always going to be people who like the real stuff. But they'll have to go and search for that stuff. Or, or you know, and go and find. Just like there's people looking for certain recordings and bootlegs and big fans of bands. Can, can uh, AI replace composers? Not only it can replace composers, but... The composers are now doing that to themselves without knowing it. And what I'm saying that is the first thing they have to understand is when you work on your own, you're deleting your own. That's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand in the in the mechanical way, or let's call it the, me the mechanics of the industry. When one guy says, 
oh, they don't have a budget, so I have to do everything. It's not true they don't have a budget. They don't allocate the budget. That's the big difference. They have the budget. They can give it, but they sa- they decide not to because they can get away with that. The money stays there. Now, when someone says, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do that, okay, when you're wearing so many hats, you're basically starting the position of taking people out of the equation. Every time you take someone else from the equation and adding more hats to you, that's what will happen to you because the AI will replace the person who done all that. Now, I've seen this happen for years and I've told people this ages ago, like I'm saying ages, like years ago. If you only work on your own and you don't have other people working with you, people will get used to that and they expect to get get more from you. Okay, and you'll give them satisfactory result. They'll be happy. Tomorrow they meet someone who is a tad, maybe even less good than you. But he's cheaper. But he'll do everything. They'll hire him. Now you have to lower your price because now you got to compete with him. So you lower your price. Now they maybe come back to you. But the other guy lowers his price, but he got better now. And he's good enough now. Now they go to him. Okay. All this back and forth because people are saying there's no budget or stuff like that, or or uh, they're willing to do that, like, or they're not willing to share the wealth by, you know, taking a production and paying someone to finish to do the other job. So what happens is you get more and more on you. The AI will p- replace the you that you replace the others. So anyone in this industry. AI can replace. And it will. It's just a matter of time. Now, in the beginning, it might not replace all because still people will like certain things. Later on, it will replace more. There still might be people who would be working for those who don't want the AI. But be careful because if you play with AI, AI, you're not really playing with it. They're teaching it. Okay? And if you're worried about it, there's a reason to be worried. Okay? Um, Today's composers are not what composers were 20 years ago. The tools you have now make it easy for you to work. Or 20 years ago was a different case. 40 years ago was a different case. Okay? 10 years from now, There'll be so many composers out of work. Because even though there's so much content, there'll be more composers too. Because more people will be able to hone the skills of operating, you know, the DAWs, you know, composing stuff, using samples, maybe ripping out some parts from others. Yeah. So that's my take on AI. I don't participate in the AI um, in terms of, you know, some people claim certain things are AI, but they're not. They're just algorithmic, which means they have a certain set of tools inside that um, measured stuff and responds to stuff. But it's not AI. It's just algorithmic planning and you know, based on data, but not not really artificial intelligence, like thinking of what is what, you know, it's like, they're just like, this hit that level, the client wanted that, let's, uh, let's put that EQ and that EQ and th- that's like presets. Yeah, interesting. You know, the podcast is called Rewind, an optimistic podcast about career in music. And that was a little bit of a pessimistic view of how AI will change the music industry. It's not pessimistic. It's realistic. That's the big difference. Okay. To be pessimist about something is taking the sad road without being conscious to the reality. Okay. Think of it just like bringing depression when something is happy, okay? Realistic is dealing with it, okay? You know, um, 30 years ago, 
people who were composing music were not using the tools that you're using. And they would look at what you're doing, you know, as, oh, that's programming. Programming, right? But that's how composition is today. You know what I mean? Definitely, yeah. So it's the same thing. It's just being realistic. And uh, nothing bad about taking negative and turning it to positive. I think what, what can be done in a positive way right now towards the AI is do your best work now. Bring your best to the table. So people will like to work with you because they like the results they get from you. And if you work harder, you will get more and achieve more from it. So that is the positive view of the realistic situation. Definitely. And I think it brings us very nicely to the last question. What tips would you give to young mixing or mastering engineers that are starting right now their career in the music industry from your own experience and also from that discussion about AI? Which tips would you give to those people? I think the first most important people have to understand that we're in a service industry. So we can bring our talent, skills, knowledge, taste. Yeah, that's that's a given. That's what we're bringing. But we also have to remember we're serving people. Now, what we're doing, I think, is magical. Okay, we're adding something to something. Okay, we're taking someone's music and we make it sound better. I see that as, as sacred. It's magical. It's amazing. But at the end of the day, they have to live with that record, with that music, with that song. We also live with it, but we move on to other projects. Today we do this, tomorrow we do that, the next week we do this, you know. For them, they have to live with that longer. Some of them will have one record in their whole career. Some of them will have 20 records or 10. Some of them will have one song or three songs. You need to bring to them what you can with what you have because you're dealing with the results of what's given to you. But always remember you're like a server. You know, someone asks you, can you bring me another... Uh, drink well you bring the drink right so you are doing that as a professional in this industry and sometimes you won't agree with the client that's fine because they might be wrong and sometimes they might be right it might be a good idea to to give them your opinion but at the end of the day you really want them to be happy and You got to do what you got to do. And, but at the same time, you know, be smart with your decisions. You know, if it sounds horrible, at least tell them that, that, you know, I, I'm not saying tell them that it's horrible, but at least tell them that you think it can be better and, and give them something better. And if they still choose the one that's less good, then at least you gave them something better to choose from. And they made that decision. And, and if people judge you based on that, you can always say, well, I gave them something else, but that's what they wanted. So we have to remember we're a service business. Okay. And the second thing, uh, communications is key. And things can get lost in translation. Emails can be read in a certain way. And there's a lot of sub-information, like I call it sub-information because I don't want to use the word context because it's not a cool word now. <laughs> but there's sub-context. But what I'm saying is you have to read between the lines and a lot of times it's hard to understand, especially if you work international And there's different people from different places around the world, even if they write in English, they might use different words to describe what they're thinking. So be aware that sometimes you need to read it a few times or 
hop on a call with them just to figure out exactly what they say. And, uh, and, um, connect with other peers in this industry because you never know. Someone can bring you work. Someone can help you. Sometimes you need a help and, I don't know, one of your devices got broken or a computer's messed up and you need somebody to help you fix it or know someone. So it's good to know people in the industry too and, and not just be like, ah, I don't know anybody, I just do my own thing. Because at the end of the day, it's a community. The music industry is a community of people. Some of it is local, some of it is international. I think those are the the easy and hard tips at the same time. Because they're not technical, they're just, you know, but it just, they're just things that are good to do. And it's not a bad idea to work in sales to get experience in that. And it's not a bad idea to work in serving to get used to serving clients and it's a uh, and it's a good idea to practice a lot and it's not bad to do free work too because free work is still work and you practice and you become better and people can appreciate that too sometimes but um on technical side um one thing i do recommend a big tip um don't be afraid to experiment try things if you have a friend who has a certain gear that you don't go to him play with it have sessions try out stuff i don't know take an hour or two in a studio just to experiment with gear you never tried before you know um i don't know rent rent something try it out it's not bad to demo equipment or go to a store and try out and listen to stuff it's good for the ear. It's good for the mind. Maybe a bit hard on the pocket, but <laughs> but uh, but it's fun and it's inspirational too. Yeah, I think these are great tips to end this uh, very interesting and inspirational episode. And I totally agree with you about what you said about working with people. They they are they say that this day they say that nowadays emotional intelligence, which means understanding what the other person is saying and feeling is much more important than general intelligence, which is like mathematical intelligence and so f- and so on. So emotional intelligence is always a key uh, for working with people and understanding what exactly do they want and how do they feel about what you've provided them. Yeah, I, and I think you can sum it up just in communication. Like be open to talk with somebody, you know, listen to what they want to say. Yeah, this is a great way to wrap up this episode, but or Applebaum directly from your beautiful studio in LA. Thank you so much for joining this episode. I think it was very, very interesting and full of inspirational tips episode. And thank you again for your time and for all the information that you've shared. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And I want to wish everybody all the best and good luck with all the music and composing and writing and producing, engineering, mixing, everything you're doing. It's not easy. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes persistence. But at the end of the day, if it's part of you, then just do it. Amen. And to all the listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. I see the numbers growing up from each and ep- every episode, and it's really exciting for me to see that, that this podcast is becoming more and more a part of people's lives. And feel free to reach out with any questions that you have. If you have um, an idea for a guest that you want to appear in the show, or if you have any question about the guests or the show, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. You can visit my website at www.awinermusic.com. And most importantly, don't forget to rate the podcast and give it a follow. It will help it reach more people who might find it interesting. And if you liked this episode, don't forget to rewind it and send it to a friend. I will see you in the next episode with another awesome guest. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Welcome to Rewind, an optimistic podcast that'll help you in your successful career in music. 
Amit Weiner hosts musicians, composers, professors, and sound wizards as they share their life stories and career decisions. 